Welcome back everyone to the afternoon sessions of our third and last day here at the new Babylon Conference Center in The Hague. We're all uh, returning from a three hour break uh, in which I hope you had a chance to take some lunch or uh, maybe even meet some people in the, in the virtual space that we have created. I urge you to go and visit the online island. We certainly met a couple of you there, which was kind of fun. Uh, it was good to introduce, for example, one of the speakers of this morning, Rose Boer, to one of the speakers of this afternoon, uh, Petter Lindqvist, uh, to each other. Uh, we didn't see too many people, though, uh, and that's fine, too. Uh, uh, organizing an online conference like this is for us also a learning experience, and maybe that uh, a virtual online island is just not the right solution to the right problem, right? Um, this morning, we heard from Omar and Rose a lot about very diverse types of civilian harm already. We heard about uh, direct physical impact uh, in the form of civilian deaths and civilian injuries. But we also heard about non-physical impacts, uh, such as war trauma or the continued sense of fear among children and not able to return to school or the loss of perspective of uh, population groups. And we also heard about several forms of less direct or indirect and longer lasting effects. We heard about the prospect that it will take longer than a decade to clear all the rubble in Mosul and Raqqa. And we also heard about the lack of rebuilt medical facilities four years after the retaking of Mosul and how this in itself is becoming a new cause of harm during the COVID pandemic. And we heard about impediments to econ economic recovery and the effects that this has on communities over longer periods of time. Finally, or not finally, uh, there, were, there were more examples, but the final example here that I want to give is that we heard a little bit about children not being able to go or dropping out of schools, uh, uh, particularly in Mosul. The picture it painted, as Aaron said, was bleak, and I think it was also very complex. These and many other examples have been the reason why in the past year a number of organizations contribute to what we now call the Frontlines Lab on Advancing Frontline Foreseeability, a long name. Its goals are ambitious. The goal is to develop tools that may help understand but possibly even predict pathways of harm. The lab is a joint initiative of New America and Arizona State University and currently includes partnerships with Drexel University and Pax. The Advisory Council of the Labs Advancing Frontline Foreseeability Consortium project includes Sarah Holowinski, Marla Keenan, Myra Olsen, Candace Rondo and myself, Wilbert van der Zijden. Myra, Candace and Marla will present the efforts of the consortium in a pre-recorded presentation of about 30 minutes. We will watch this presentation together. And after the presentation, I will be joined by Wim Zwijnenburg and Alma Alosta, who will use the experience and knowledge from their own research and work to reflect on the presentation. Towards the end, we will also hopefully be joined by Marla Keenan, who is in the United States and just, just about now waking up, we imagine, on screen for a very brief panel discussion, if time permits. But first now, we will jointly watch the Frontlines Lab presentation. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we want to send our thanks to PAX for inviting us, along with uh, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for inviting us to talk today about some new ideas that we have on um, different ways we can improve our understanding of uh, pr the protection of civilians in conflict and in crisis. Um, before I dive into all that, I just want to kind of give you a little background about um, our project and about this collaborative effort with PAX. Uh, with our partners at Drexel University uh, and, and others to try and advance foreseeability uh, in the field and on the front lines when it comes to the reverberating effects of, of harm uh, to civilians uh, in the conflict set setting. So I'm a professor uh, at uh, Arizona State University. Uh, I work with the Center on the Future of War and I also uh, work with New America with their international security program. And this whole um, project kind of evolved out of a conversation with Marla and with Mira, uh, who are on with me today, um, as we kind of grappled with the questions of um, what it means to um, protect civilians, not just when the bombs drop or the bullets fly, um, but that after period when everything is, you know, destroyed. Um, and we really wanted to take a look at whether or not there are new means of using 
um, leveraging the digital revolution to our advantage, um, using AI, using machine learning, using modeling capabilities to really take in uh, new approaches to data modeling, uh, to understand this environment. And so, uh, you know, having had those conversations with Mira and with Marla, um, our organizations came together, um, ASU, New America, Drexel University, and we decided we wanted to sort of hatch this plan uh, to work also with PACS on developing a, a modeling capacity, a dynamic modeling capacity. It's not just one model we're talking about here. We're talking about um, a real ability to broadly push out into the community of practice who is interested in the protection of civilians, um, uh, you know, the ability to foresee when the collapse of a building or destruction of a road might mean something more serious later down the line in terms of harm to civilians. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna turn it over to Marla uh, and Mira to introduce themselves and talk a little bit more about the project. Okay, thank you. And hi everyone. As Candace mentioned, my name is Mira Olson and I'm an engineering professor at Drexel University. So while my background is in water resources and environmental engineering, for the past few years, I've been working to develop and launch a new program in peace engineering which helps prepare engineers to work as better partners in complex situations like conflict zones or fragile nations or post-disaster. Peace engineering merges engineering with social and applied sciences and with peace building for kind of two purposes, for the dual purposes of integrating technical and analysis and engineering into practices like peace building or conflict resolution or stabilization, but also for infusing conflict sensitivity and peace building skills into engineering design and practice. So our approach is really one based on partnership and doing what we can to better understand and to advance the work of these partners. So that's why it's been such a pleasure to work with Candice and with Marla. Great, um, my name is Marla Keenan and I work on this project both through PAX and through New America. Uh, in my day job, I'm actually working with the Stimson Center and you'll hear from me, I believe later in the conference about our work with NATO. Um, but I've been working on the issue of civilian harm and civilian protection for about 15 years, um, mostly on the advocacy and research side. So it's a pleasure for me to get to work with folks like Candace and Mira uh, to try and put a more holistic picture of what we're looking at. We can hear the stories of people on the ground and we need to make sure that those are fed in to our sort of more systematic approach as we think about the reverberating effects of civilian harm, um, particularly in urban areas. And you'll hear us talk a lot about sort of the emerging uh, conflict contexts here today. So before we get started, um, I just want to hand it back over to Candace, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the actual lab and how it works. Right. Thanks, Marla. So um, the lab really is in the beginning stages of um, evolving into a consortium between research centers um, and university at universities, as well as think tanks uh, like New America. Our real goal here is to try and also draw in the NGO community um, into this conversation about what kind of data is needed uh, in order to understand um, how things are changing on the ground in a very dynamic way uh, when conflict is unfolding. Uh, what we do know is that it, it can be really hard uh, to distinguish the signal from the noise when so much is going on. You have um, migration, you have um, still some, sometimes hostilities in place uh, at, at a given time, um, you have destruction of property. And so what we understood is that there's no one university, no one think tank that is going to be able to pull something like this off by itself. Um, you need a lot of brilliant minds to apply um, themselves to this problem, um, which is this challenge of enabling both the military uh, sector and the humanitarian sector um, to really understand what the effects of decisions are in the field um, and what they, what they might look like in the long term. Uh, and so this consortium spans from Philadelphia um, to the Netherlands, to Washington DC and all the way out in Arizona, but we're really hoping to grow it. Uh, and we are looking forward to this conversation as kind of a beginning um, to a, a wider conversation with the research community and the practitioner community on how we can build this capability. So um, without going too much further into it, I thought it'd be helpful maybe to show you a video, uh, a brief video about kind of what we're about. Civilians suffer in conflicts around the world, yet nobody can tell you the real toll. Some security forces track deaths and injuries, but civilian harm isn't only physical, and it doesn't only happen when a bullet is fired or a bomb dropped. Psychological trauma, fear, and lifelong anxiety are just as harmful, sometimes more so than a physical injury. Environmental poisoning, explosive remnants scattered across fields and parks, and forced displacement 
leave communities frayed to the breaking point. And there's the long-term effects of infrastructure damage or destruction. The roads and bridges, hospitals, power plants, and water treatment centers are all critical to the health and well-being of the people who live there. None of this is captured in civilian death tolls that have become the standard way of measuring the impact of war on civilians. Civilian casualty counts are insufficient and will be even less effective as conflicts become more complicated in urban areas. Through cyber and with artificial intelligence creating the opportunity for remote fighting, at least for the warring parties. Humanitarian, military, and policymaker communities try to capture data about civilian harm, but it's random at best. That only adds to the confusion. But what if there were a way to cut through the fog of war, to gather and analyze all kinds of data on civilian harm? Frontline's lab is working to create just that. We call it a dynamic modeling capability for civilian harm. It is an analytic model that integrates data, a way to integrate data and predicts the long-term impacts of specific actions in real time. This new tool will assist governments, militaries, and humanitarian actors in understanding and anticipating military operations reverberating effects on civilians. It will be a crucial tool to minimize danger to civilians living through conflict. We owe them nothing less. So as you can see, modern warfare is often waged in densely populated and urban uh, environments, and the resulting harm is reverberating, meaning it's not just the death and the injury that may happen in the moment, it's not just the destruction of the individual building, but it's actually how that harm then reverberates both across time and space, um, and looking at how it also uh, impacts critical infrastructure. So traditional ways that militaries and governments have both tracked and recorded civilian casualties doesn't capture this reverberating uh, effect, um, especially in the conflicts that may happen in the future. When we pull in proxy wars, when we talk about hybrid warfare, um, we need a new way of looking at this problem. And we think that what we've come up with is a starting pathway to do that. And so Candace, can you tell us a little bit more about where the idea for this project came from? Yeah, I mean, you know, like you, Marla, I, I've spent also a lot of time, um, you know, looking at conflicts, um, living in conflicts, and, and sort of watching their effects take place, um, particularly kind of the institutional impact on, on, um, on governments and sort of their inability to then contain uh, the reverberating effects from, from conflict. Um, while I was in Afghanistan, where I lived and worked for five years, um, this discussion about collateral damage and um, particularly damage to infrastructure, uh, you know, and, and hospitals and clinics was an everyday conversation. Uh, and then when I went to work for the US uh, Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, and we were reevaluating uh, the way in which the US military in particular was operating in the Afghan theater um, and looking at the different ways, um, the conflicting ways uh, different agencies, you know, different military organizations would collect data and information about what collateral damage and harm to civilians actually meant. Um, and it's, it was out of those debates and those disputes uh, and, that, and that confusion over methodology that I first began thinking, um, there's got to be a better way. Uh, there's got to be a better way to sort of, one, work with practitioners uh, in the field and also policymakers to help us kind of standardize our, our approach to how we collect data, what we collect, when we collect it, and how we preserve it, um, and then how to turn that into something uh, that can be a, serve as a dynamic modeling capacity. And because what we know is conflict is always changing. As you just pointed out, um, proxy warfare today is now a much more prominent feature of conflicts around the world uh, than it was certainly 20 years ago uh, when uh, the 9-11 uh, attacks happened, right? And so, and we have seen these types of changes over time historically, um, and we need to be able to anticipate that. And that's where this modeling capacity idea kind of came into play. Uh, and when I started talking with uh, Mira about it uh, and realized that the peace engineering program uh, at Drexel was also beginning to grapple with these questions, um, that's when the idea kind of the light bulb went on, I think for everybody. Um, and Mira, you're an engineer. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you and your colleagues uh, became interested in, in applying engineering to conflict and a little bit more about the peace engineering uh, work that you do and how that fits into the work of the lab? 
Yeah, absolutely. So as, as Candace mentioned, we know that damage to infrastructure, to roads, water and power systems, hospitals, schools can have long term impacts on communities. We're also coming to understand that any infrastructure or technology has the potential to either create or mitigate conflict or to be used or misused. And that it's important for anyone doing the planning or the design to really understand how the system works, how people access goods and services, what happens when they can't, and how we can better plan for resiliency. And that's really part of the peace engineering process. Engineers are good at planning for design and use, but not necessarily for failure or misuse, which is what we're dealing with in urban warfare. So we're really trying to understand the context in which infrastructure services can be disrupted and then later repaired and maintained. Right, it's really about building those resiliencies um, into systems and, and building resiliency into the planning process as well, uh, and kind of thinking forward to what things might look like. Uh, but of course, it's important for us to really talk about what we mean uh, when we're talking about civilian harm. Uh, that obviously has been debated again also for a long time. And I think Marley, you probably have the most experience with that. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, counting casualties is hardly a new concept. Um, obviously, statistics have been kept in, in war at various levels throughout history, including in World War I in Korea, but it wasn't a systematic approach to gathering information. We really started seeing attention to civilian casualty counting um, in the wars uh, that are post 9-11, so in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Um, and the reason why this started was that the military itself really recognized that there was an importance in understanding the impact that they were having. Um, but they were just gathering information about, okay, we think, you know, someone might have been killed here. We think someone might have been injured here. Or, you know, we were trying to hit no civilians, but it's possible we hit a few here. It wasn't a systematic approach and it wasn't um, the type of data that could be used to really do hard analysis uh, to figure out what was going wrong and how those civilian casual casualties could be avoided in the, in the future. Now, some, some progress has been made, um, including in Afghanistan and Iraq. There were civilian casualty tracking cells that were implemented um, at ISAF, also um, a little bit of nascent work with the African Union, um, but still a more systematic approach is needed, both that works across the whole of government and then also with organizations like Frontlines Lab, where we're looking to not only understand the data that's coming in from the military side that can be shared outside of the military, but also pulling in all the various um, different types of data that are coming in from humanitarians and from governments. Um, so I want to give a little bit of an example of how this has worked in the past. So civil society um, and academics are incredibly interested in this topic, and I think that's important. But these disparate approaches have made it challenging to work together and to really kind of fit together the various data pieces. Um, you know, think about it like a, like a big puzzle. It's like one person has one piece or may have five pieces, but they don't really necessarily know that there are other pieces that might link into it. So... Um, there are a few things on which general consensus has emerged. And for example, uh, the organization that I formerly worked with, and many of you will know, Center for Civilians in Conflict, or CIVIC as they're called, um, and also Every Casualty. Um, in the mid 2000s or 2010s, in the mid 2010s, um, worked on two separate approaches. So CIVIC was focused on working with militaries on civ civilian casualty tracking analysis and response. And that's the internal, the military's or government's internal capability to track and analyze the information in order to change um, the way that they, they um, do their operations. Then on the other side, every casualty was working on what they call casualty recording, which was actually going in and documenting individual cases, individual people, the names, where they lived, what they experienced. That can be done by civil society groups, but also by governments. Um, and you know, at the time, it was really important for us to work together because there was a lot of confusion about those two approaches. And while they're separate, they're really important and they're synergistic because you really need to understand from both sides what's happening both from the military standpoint and happening from the civil society standpoint. Um, and so I think that was a very helpful effort and something that in my mind has always kind of, as we were talking about a consortium that is, you know, academia and its governments and its militaries and its, its NGOs, um, I think it's really important that we're, we're approaching it from this sort of 360 degree approach. Um, so Candace, you and I have talked many times uh, about definitions of civilian harm and, and how hard it really is um, to, to get somebody sort of all of us singing from the same song sheet, uh, so to speak. And so can you talk about that challenge, especially in relation to the creation of this model? Yeah, I mean, look, there, there are some really big choices um, you have to make when you are thinking about developing uh, a model uh, in a singular form, right? One is, what are you gonna measure? Um, is it indirect or is it direct casualties? 
Um, what is an indirect casualty exactly? Um, I think there are still some debates about what that really means. Um, you know, one of the most famous studies done uh, was back in the day in, I think it was 2006, um, there was a Lancet study by a, a team of researchers, some of whom were connected, I believe, to every casualty counts, um, mm -hmm. who went out to Iraq and tried to figure out um, what does indirect harm really mean? What are indirect casualties? And what's the effect, the reverberating effect of, um, you know, the loss of hospitals, the loss of roadways, water, et cetera, uh, on the population overall. Um, those debates about, you know, definitions, direct, indirect, uh, civilian casualty versus civilian harm can make it really hard to have the same conversation uh, with the people who really matter, right? Uh, you want to have uh, military planners and, and officials as well as policymakers and humanitarian uh, first responders, uh, as well as reconstruction planners. You want them all at the same table hopefully using the same language. Um, that can be really difficult to do. And so the idea behind creating a consortium, one, is to try and develop a common language, um, and two, uh, to try and get that conversation going and keep it sustained. Uh, one of the challenges we've had policy-wise is kind of breaking off communications when things get heated uh, in particular conflicts. We saw that in Iraq, we saw that in Yemen. Um, we've seen that in many times over and over again. But you know, the people who are almost always there consistently throughout, are the engineers, the urban planners, um, the water systems uh, repair specialists. Those are the folks that we feel like um, they provide a continuity uh, that isn't there yet. And so that's kind of the idea behind the consortium. Uh, and I think, you know, Mira could probably talk a little bit more uh, about, you know, that side of things, the engineering side of things. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say with the engineers, one of the most important things is helping them understand the context in which they're working. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit how we've started to look at how to start even beginning to understand these reverberating effects. So we've started by taking a systems approach to understanding civilian services like public health and infrastructure and socioeconomic processes, and then all of the effects that can influence how well these function. And the first step is trying to capture and understand these rever reverberating effects of warfare. So I should clarify that by reverberating effects, we mean all of the harm suffered by the civilian population in a given armed conflict, or maybe even in just one individual act of that armed conflict, both immediately and long-term in the future. So if we think about those impacts, like the deaths and the injuries are the most obvious harms and possibly the easiest to track as seen at the top of this middle column. But as we move down this list, other harms may include psychological scarring and trauma or property damage and damage to infrastructure and water supplies, lack of access to hospitals or healthcare or education, limited mobility, scarcity of jobs, lasting environmental impacts, and so on and so on. And all of these might have carry on effects with those as well. Um, so all of these work to damage the necessary services and public health and socioeconomic processes ne necessary for growth and recovery. So Marla, I know you've done a lot of work with policymakers and with military. Perhaps you can tell us why it's important to make these connections and to try to think about understanding um, these long-term effects. Sure. Um, so I know many of you may be thinking, but we can barely get our hands around, you know, direct effects, you know, de uh, deaths and injuries. But I think it's really important for policymakers and military planners to understand the reverberating effects because that can actually guide what needs to happen with regard to future planning, um, including increased training and deployment of resources to minimize the duration of the intensity of the harm. So I just want to tell a really quick story because I think this is so illustrative of what we're talking about. I remember um, I was talking to a senior military advisor on some of the work that was being done in Iraq. And there was a story about how much time and care had been taken to strike um, this one, you know, they had seen this, this one truck going back and forth over a bridge and they had taken so much time trying to make sure it was the right person and it was the right truck and it was everything. And, you know, they, they ended up having to strike it while it was on the bridge. But what they didn't understand was that under the bridge, there was a main, there was a huge water main. And so they were able to avoid civilian casualties. They only hit that truck. They only hit the exact target that they were going after. But in the meantime, they had broken a main waterway and cut off um, thousands of civilians from water. So those are the types of things we're talking here because, you know, we need to understand these things if we're going to get to better lessons learned and understanding how to improve operation. So, um, you know, from a legal standpoint, when we talk about understanding the reverberating effects, one thing that we talk about is feasible precautions under IHL. 
And I think it's really important for us to understand, you know, if we had a better understand of what already existed, what underlay the city in which uh, the operations were taking place, if we could actually understand what those feasible precautions could be and that they could be, um, they could help uh, play into planning. And then of course, for humanitarian organizations, it's incredibly important for this information to be out there because they need real time uh, information to plan their work and to understand how to pre-position um, you know, their logistical supplies. So for them, it's also incredibly need, uh, important for them to understand when they're tasked with facilitating access to basic need for the civilian communities. Um, and then of course, um, it's, it's also important for civilians themselves because when civilians are harmed, when civilians are killed, when their families are losing their livelihoods, when they've lost their home or their job, it's incredibly important for their dignity to be able to understand what happened to them and to, to be ensured that someone is looking at this and someone is actually working with data that can help understand how to better protect them in the future. Um, so, Mira, uh, right now we kind of have nas nascent capabilities with modeling. Um, can you talk a little bit about where we are with that and how we're working to understand the reverberating effects of civilian harm? Yeah, so even before we get to the quantitative modeling, the sheer complexity of accurately capturing the reality of armed conflict is definitely a challenge. Um, and on the technical side, there are other limitations as well. So including defining the harm categories and understanding infrastructure interdependencies. So how much of the water system will be taken out if the electricity goes down? And how much does communication depend on having the electricity? So um, there's those interdependencies, there's ambiguous data, there's analysis frameworks, lack of consensus on ways to connect um, existing but disparate information, definitely data gaps and methodological uncertainties. So all of these technical um, uncertainties make it even more challenging and these limitations potentially compound one another. So as a result, our understanding of civilian harm is kind of like that puzzle you mentioned. It's got a lot of missing pieces and any methodological improvement hinges on advancements in data collection techniques and data integration varying across different conflict contexts. So additionally, measurement and documentation of harm increasingly becomes complicated when defining civilian harm expands beyond traditional indicators and incorporates social and communal damage categories. We're not great at integrating data from different sources. These mixed method approaches though, we're integrating quantitative data and social data is really important and part of the whole modeling and um, understanding process. So Candace, I'm wondering if you could talk to us, you've done a lot of research and work on future wars, including hybrid and proxy, how will future conflicts compound the challenges of understanding these river reverberating effects? So, I mean, it's interesting, as you were talking, Mira, I was sort of reflecting on how um, when, you're, when you're developing models, you also kind of need to know um, kind of tempo. You need to understand what kind of munitions are being used in a given environment. Uh, you need to understand what that environment might look like, you know, the built environment. Um, and I think there are some things that we now know um, in large part because of our recent experience, uh, the world's recent experience and uh, tragic in, in Yemen and in Syria, uh, and I think increasingly elsewhere, we know that there, the scale um, of harm to civilians uh, is gonna be affected by um, a few things. First, um, we know that urban warfare uh, is gonna be with us for a long time to come uh, and probably will be prevalent for a number of reasons. One, that's where populations are concentrated. Uh, and you know, at the end of the day, war is about trying to find ways to um, impress upon uh, uh, populations, um, you know, whatever message is being delivered uh, via military action. And so urban warfare we know is gonna be a reality. We know that most cities, um, that most people will be living in cities by 2050. Um, and, um, and that's something that we have to think about, the built environment in cities. Um, we also know that emerging technologies and cyber attacks are gonna play a role in um, the future of conflict. They already are. Uh, we saw that in Ukraine. Uh, we've seen that in Syria, we've seen that in Libya, uh, where you know, social media, um, messaging, videos, um, propaganda, disinformation, uh, as well as critical infrastructure attacks, right, to take out systems um, are all part of the mix. And um, we have to anticipate that that will also have reverting, reverting effects on civilians. Um, remote warfare, which is something we kind of talk about a little bit in uh, the paper that we've been working on, um, which is this idea that you know, most large scale countries um, you know, with modern militaries are gonna be doing a lot of the fighting um, from computer screens, right? Um, it's gonna be kind of a networked approach 
Uh, there are going to be drones. There's going to be you know satellite surveillance. Um, there are going to be you know uh, platforms in the field that are part of the military approach, part of the hostilities, um, but it'll be at an arm's length. Uh, and that introduces new uh, wrinkles into the time uh, factor, right? Um, and, that's, and that's another piece that you have to kind of factor in. And then um, large scale combat operations between near peer uh, competitors. That's something that uh, at New America, we've been spending a lot of time on recently is this idea of you know, great, great power competition, uh, particularly between China uh, and the United States. Um, so I think you, know, you might anticipate, for instance, uh, in parts of Asia where that might come to, to play out. Um, and then between Russia uh, and the United States in particular, uh, where we've already seen it start to play out in the Middle East and in Africa. Uh, so that near peer competition, um, also I think you know, Iran is, is worth mentioning here uh, between Iran and Saudi Arabia is gonna also have kind of effects on uh, the scale of, of human, of harm to, to civilians uh, in the field. And this is not it. I mean, there, there are many, many more things uh, you know, that we could probably mention here, but um, those are the main, I think, takeaways uh, from a lot of the work we've been looking, looking at in terms of the future of conflict and how it will affect uh, civilians and protection of civilians. So I guess we have to think of how we move forward and what a dynamic model and what a, a framework for dynamic modeling would look like. So I guess if we think that there are currently no predictive capabilities for the reverberating effects of conflict on civilians. So I think any step forward is, is important. We know that operations have far reaching effects and consequences for civilians through anecdotes and reason. But as of yet, we can't really capture, measure, or fully understand the connections or what's gonna lead to what in the field. So I think what we need to start with is a methodology, a framework um, for mapping and understanding the complex system that is the urban space, specifically concerning its provision of core infrastructure services. And we need a mechanism for communicating with each other and sharing data and integrating data from different sources. So this will draw on expertise in urban infrastructure and systems modeling and risk assessment and technology implementation. So, and this can help build an understanding of the urban environment before conflict or violence erupts so that we're better able to predict. So what we're looking at is an adaptive and dynamic model that will help us uncover the complexities of urban infrastructure services with goals of identifying redundancy and interoperability that may provide resilience, which is key here, during conflict-induced system failures. There are so many benefits for all stakeholders from governments and militaries to humanitarian actors and of course to citizens themselves. And, and we'd be hoping to increase the ability to sense, collect and analyze situationally relevant data in real time in a conflict setting. We'd hope to build better decision support tools to provide actionable information to meet civilian needs during the conflict. Um, and we'd also hope to guide the creation of interoperable systems. So infrastructure services that have redundancy built in so that if something goes out, another thing can take over um, that provide reliable infrastructure and services in conflict settings. So we've devised a way forward through a two-year pilot program. Um, and Candace, I'll send it to you to think about what is needed in the next phase. Well, there's obviously a lot we need. Um, I think the team uh, at Frontlines Lab, uh, you know, we have a few different efforts going on, but this, this pilot um, this two-year pilot is something that we're really focused on. Um, first, we really want to develop the consortium and try and build bridges with research centers, um, and, you know, not only in North America, but all over the world, uh, particularly in places where conflict is ongoing. We think it's really important to start that conversation uh, with local organizations, NGOs, um, university research centers, think tanks, um, you know, active organizations that are involved in trying to mitigate uh, and or protect civilians. Um, so that's gonna be key is developing the consortium. Um, we wanna take a transdisciplinary approach to data uh, and try and, um, you know, work with the community of practitioners on um, thinking about what to collect, how to collect it, um, you know, what to put into these models. And also I think, you know, deal with the problem of differently structured data um, from different uh, disciplines. And um, we really wanna work on a mapping of existing terminologies uh, and undertake a set of applied case studies. Um, and I think, you know, we can think of a number of different situations uh, in countries, uh, you know, where you have conflict ongoing now, where we would love to apply that model. Um, but there's probably a good case to be made um, for looking back at some historical instances um, where you kind of have hostilities relatively closed off. Um, you can kind of say what conditions were, uh, so do a retrospective um, uh, applied case study analysis. So I, I think those are the main steps. And I think 
Uh, we'll talk a little bit more in the Q&A uh, about some of the, the more detailed approaches uh, going forward. I want to thank you all for taking time uh, to watch us and, and also to Marla and Mira for the conversation. Um, looking forward to the next steps. Thank you, Myra, Kenneth, and Marla for explaining the Frontlines Lab initiative so comprehensively and, and, and laying it out so good for us. The Frontlines Lab Consortium presents its outputs uh, on our website, so the PAXProtectionOfCivilians.org website, and we'll make the link to the specific page available to you shortly. Uh, on this page, you can already find more information about the lab and about the main persons you just saw in the video and others uh, participating in the lab's efforts. Uh, but also, for example, the little clip you just saw embedded in the larger presentation. And finally, there was already mentioning of a position paper. It's already on there in its final draft version. And there will be a longer uh, uh, video uh, made of this presentation available uh, as well. Um, the Frontlines Lab is an ongoing effort, and uh, what I've personally appreciated so much about it in the past 12 months is its uh, uh, tendency or its, its, its ability to reach out to practitioners and experts of a wide variety of expertises, um, to also test whether its efforts resonate and also are considered useful by these practitioners uh, especially. And in that same vein, we have asked for this session now two protection experts to respond on the presentation. And first, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Wim Zwijnenburg. Wim is a humanitarian disarmament project leader at PAX, and although, and throughout his career, has often found himself on the forefront of new research fields. When I met, first met uh, Wim about 10 years ago, uh, he was primarily working on arms proliferation uh, and remote warfare. Later, we co collaborated shortly on uh, laying the foundations for research on toxic remnants of war, and uh, been moved on to uh, really become one of the world's leading experts on conflict uh, and the, sorry, the impacts of conflict on the environment. And for this work, he received the UNEP OCHA Green Star Award in 2017. Uh, he is also a frequent contributor to the open source investigative journalism collective Bellingcat. Wim joins me here live in the studio here at the conference center. Uh, Wim, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Wilbert, and thanks for an opportunity to respond to this uh, really uh, in, a great uh, introduction to the uh, issue of protection of civilians uh, and the wider reverberating effects. Um, the reason we basically were getting into um, this uh, topic um, was years ago when um, we were working in Iraq and the communities we were working with were um, concerned about the impacts of the Iran of the, the war in the U.S. Uh, 2003 from the invasion, how it impacted their uh, communities, and in particular from uh, munition remnants. And throughout the last couple, um, yeah, basically of the last decade, we've been working also looking at other conflicts and looking at how what the impacts are of the conflict on environment and health. And the reason we looked into this is because we noted that in addressing issues around um, military operations and the, the legacies, and particularly the environmental legacies, can have long-term, short and long-term impacts on, on the environment and uh, where which, which people also depend on. So basically we've witnessed uh, the direct acute risks from uh, attacks on uh, chemical factories, oil fields, um, the toxic remnants that were littered on the battlefield and in urban cities, but also longer term implications of environmental damage uh, from destruction of uh, water infrastructure that had issues, that had problems, uh, created problems, uh, public health problems around access to clean water, uh, problems around solid waste management that could lead to um, further uh, impacts on public health from uh, the communicable diseases, but also longer term implications as water systems were damaged and had impact on agricultural practices because uh, people didn't have access to uh, water for irrigation. Um, so I think the issue we ran into, I think what I really like about this project uh, from the movie is that um, there is a, a wide, a wider ranges of opportunities to look into data collection and monitoring that can, uh, first of all, help understand what the impacts of, the, especially the reverberating effects are of, uh, of uh, military operations, and also uh, what, um, like the uh, the wealth of data that's currently available, that we can use to uh, better monitor and understand um, the long-term implications. So, um, to give you some examples. Um, 
I think in uh, what we've seen, for example, in, in Syria and, and Iraq is um, continuous sustained damage to oil infrastructure that had direct impacts from like pollution, uh, but also the longer term implications, um, which were oil pollution contributed to the rise of makeshift oil refineries, which was is a widespread practice throughout uh, Syria over the last, basically between 2000, 2013, 2012, 2013 till 2017, 19, 2019, there are still ongoing um, upper, uh, uh, places where a makeshift refining uh, is happening, uh, where a lot of civilians are involved. And currently we have, I think over, we mapped and documented this using remote sensing over uh, yeah, probably 30, 40,000 makeshift refinery structures where also a lot of children are working. So this is a direct impact, uh, like a sort of consequence of targeting oil facilities um, that result in uh, civilians doing this kind of work. Um, but yeah, there's also uh, like wider uh, issues around um, like the impact of it on uh, agriculture um, and uh, public health. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, there are direct risks from shelling uh, that are uh, that could cause uh, an environmental catastrophe as uh, chemical factories can be hit. Um, water infrastructure has been targeted there as well, but severe risk from uh, a local chemical incident because a lot of chlorine is being stored in uh, water filtration stations. And also the longer term implications from attacks of water pumping stations uh, is an issue in Ukraine because uh, there's a lot of toxic and radioactive waste stored in abandoned coal mines. And if the water pumping stations are not working, the, the, the groundwater can uh, flood the coal mines and the waste can come up and uh, make basically a whole area uh, uninhabitable for the next decades. Uh, in Iraq, we saw issues around uh, burning of oil wells, which created humanitarian problems uh, because of the wells were burning for over nine months, uh, where uh, IDP camps uh, with displaced uh, Iraqis were living under the toxic smoke and also longer term implications on the land. So these are sort of a couple of issues. We're working on many other issues where we've now had. And um, I think what we're looking at now is like we can include all these kind of data sets using remote sensing, earth observation, open source information to better understand those impacts and also engage with militaries uh, on targeting practices. So what can we do to sort of make this better? Um, so there, there are legal processes to uh, improve uh, accountability and transparency over military operations uh, with regards to targeting. There are, um, in particular, uh, engagement with the military is important, and I want to here to uh, underscore the importance, for example, from the ICRC's uh, updated military guidelines for protection of the environment in times of armed conflict, which I think is a helpful process to, to engage the military on the decisions they make and the military footprint. And also from a humanitarian perspective to improve um, environmental response into humanitarian operations where data can improve understanding of how uh, what the environmental risks are for uh, populations that are affected by armed conflict. And to give you one example from what we did in Mosul, which also links to uh, the discussion on the reverberating impacts of explosive weapons, is before the, uh, the Mosul offensive started, we worked together with the uh, UNEP's uh, OCHA's Joint Environment Unit to map all the uh, potential risk sites from uh, that could be targeted in the offensive. So where are uh, sites that are storing, um, for example, um, uh, hospitals which have uh, radioactive materials or the textile industries which are storing solvents or power plants that are storing uh, PCBs. And we included that uh, to make sort of a risk assessment. Uh, the, you know, the, um, UN Environment did a great work in mapping the uh, urban damage that could create a lot of rubble. Uh, and rubble needs to be safely removed or stored, and often it's mixed with uh, solid waste or other chemicals. Uh, there are issues around munitions and explosives, so they did a proper damage assessment as well. And also the longer term implications is for reconstruction, like where do you get your materials to um, make cement? So there are serious risks there where water uh, um, around waterways that can be affected by uh, removal from uh, sand um, that's uh, used for construction, uh, constructing materials. So those are um, a couple um, of uh, ideas that we're now toying around with on like how can we map all these uh, facilities, how can we use this kind of information in reconstruction programs and to improve uh, um, better responses. And what are also the opportunities for international organizations like the World Bank and IMF to include the environmental components in post-conflict recovery and reconstruction work? Um, yeah, so that's 
basically sort of a brief lay of the land and I think the data project and uh, engagement with the military on decision making of targeting but also response and reconstruction are kind of key to uh, improving protection of civilians because that the environment they're living in is the is is also important for uh, yeah, uh, building back better and greener. Uh, so I think that's uh, if we don't address that, we will missing out a great opportunity, which which in the long term can also have uh, implications for uh, safety, stability, uh, and rebuilding of uh, of livelihoods from people. And if that environment remains um, impacted uh, and they cannot return to the areas where they live in because it's still their risk from contamination or exposure to toxic remnants, then you know, we're, uh, it would be an issue for civilians to rebuild their lives. So that's. Uh, in very short, um, yeah, some initial reactions to the movie. And um, there are also opportunities, I think, uh, with uh, the open source community and with, uh, with data, um, um, basically with, with uh, uh, universities and with academics, but also humanitarian organizations to, um, uh, to look at like, what kind of, what's the data we can uh, what we can collect that uh, can be uh, moved into um, humanitarian response um, assessments um, and how does it link with the current discussions that are going on, for example, uh, with uh, the protection, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, explosive weapons discussion, for example. Uh, but also, uh, how does it build into like larger questions around uh, environment, peace, and security? So, for example, we're currently trying to also engage with governments and states and the UN uh, uh, Security Council on looking at where uh, improvements can be made in terms of accountability of the uh, military footprint of operations, uh, the environmental footprints of military operations, um, how this improves, um, uh, where there is an opportunity to uh, improve protection of the environment, for example, with peacekeeping uh, operations. Um, and uh, yeah, that sort of builds towards state accountability uh, and response in hopefully to prevent uh, and minimize the environmental damage. Um, yeah, that's sort of uh, where we are at the moment. All right, thank you, Wim. And I, uh, I really appreciate your response to the presentation and I like how you bring in that perspective how, of how very different, in very many different ways, um, war can have an impact on the, a lasting impact on the environment. Um, also for the sake of time, I'm, I'm uh, rapidly turning to our second responder uh, who is uh, Alma Tazlidzam Alosta. Alma has devoted her career to humanitarian disarmament and protection of civilians and in that effort has worked with uh, or currently works with Humanity and Inclusion, previously uh, Handicap International. Uh, through her daily work, Alma contributes to the development of the political declaration to address the humanitarian consequences of the use of explosive weapons in populated areas and monitors the implementation of the Mine Ban Treaty and the Convention on Cluster Munitions. She also sits on the boards of Ainu, ICBL and CMC, so it sounds like a very busy uh, schedule for you uh, on a daily basis. Um, Alma, really good to see you. Uh, I think it's been a, quite a while ago that we've met, and I think back then we were both working on uh, divestment uh, issues. I think you were working for the Cluster Munitions Divestment Reports, and I was working um, on the Don't Bank on the Bomb Reports, if I'm not mistaken. Um, thanks for joining us, and uh, the floor is yours for, uh, for your pr uh, uh, reflections on the presentation of the Frontlines Lab. Thank you very much, Wilbert, and uh, thanks to the pre previous speakers. It's really a pleasure to be uh, with you today. Um, uh, I would like to share a few thoughts of, of HI uh, on this extremely important matter. Uh, we in HI have been documenting the reverberating effects of explosive weapons, looking from different angles and focusing on, let's say, different categories of population. Uh, from our presence in more than 20 countries in the situation of conflict, we have been gathering information to help us uh, understand better what are the effects of explosive weapons on civilians, talking from the direct effects like deaths and injuries and damage in general, but also these reverberating effects, which are less obvious as we have uh, seen in the video before. Um, damage to water and electricity uh, affects services such as health and water distribution, of course, leading to spread of diseases and further deaths. In the face of such devastation, surviving civilians often have to have no choice but to leave and their um, displacement is often long lasting. And I would like to talk about displacement because I think this is a very important to address today as well. 
it is very difficult to understand what part of the conflict is the most difficult uh, and which triggers people to pack all their life in few suitcases and leave their homes. We have collected hundreds of testimonies from the people uh, we have assisted in refugee camps and rehabilitation centers. And in fact, bombing and shelling, destruction of housing, lack of security has been identified as a main trigger to flee the home. Um, in our two research papers uh, we did um, in 2016 and 2018, uh, linking the impact of explosive weapons and displacement among only Syrian refugees displaced in Jordan and Lebanon, we, have, um, we, we, we gave an insight uh, on how Syrian refugees have been driven out of their homes due to the use of explosive weapons and were compelled to escape multiple times until they reached a safer place. And this multiple pattern of displacement is something that we heard for the first time uh, from, from, from our beneficiaries, from, from the refugees. Uh, specifically, the study shows how women, persons with disabilities and injuries are mostly impacted by this multiple displacement pattern in terms of social and psychological uh, consequences. While documenting the impact of explosive weapons in populated areas, we have acknowledge that there is a difference between what drives families or individuals to flee their homes and what triggers this decision. From the statement of Syrian refugees, continuous bombing and shelling can be both a direct trigger and also a slower working driver uh, of, of forced displacement. Uh, that being said, for example, uh, living in a close proximity to bombing and shelling can be a primary focus uh, and a factor that forces people to flee their homes, awaiting for oneself or loved ones to be killed, injured, or buried with rubbles in is a terrifying and traumatizing experience. A house destroyed as a result of bombing, damage, sanitation facilities, disruption of electricity supply, and destruction of essential services reasonably leads to a consideration that fleeing is most necessary or prudent. In the research that we did, almost 50% of the respondents in our research um, had their homes destroyed due to the use of explosive weapons. And almost 40% of respondents directly linked the use of explosive weapons to the destruction of civilian infrastructure. Particularly the destruction of the health services has a tremendous consequences on civilians, women particularly due to the lack of uh, reproductive health services. So to summarize, what you have been mentioning was addressed today during the whole day of, of uh, this very good conference. Um, we have deaths, we have injuries, we have psychological trauma, destruction, no or very limited access to healthcare services or education. We have rubble instead of homes, poverty, exclusion. These are all realities of people living in urban warfares and they're creating humanitarian crisis, which affected people reasonably want to escape. So, what we think would be the solution is to work with militaries to change and to apply better policies and practices to protect civilians that are living in conflict and to protect them from the use of from the impact of explosive weapons so ending this use of explosive weapons would be the would uh, would be the perfect solution to this problem we are looking also for transparency in military operations data sharing from the operations and assist assistance to victims um, and these are not only essential to provide greater protection to civilians experiencing armed conflict, but also to reduce the increase of displaced people to provide useful policies and concepts for agencies, as well as humanitarian actors working to prevent protracted uh, population displacement caused by armed conflicts. I'm not going to take this any longer. I would really like to hear more questions from, from the participants and, and I'm here at your disposal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alma, and uh, thank you also for bringing in this really important perspective of uh, displaced people, a group still often forgotten. Uh, we often see displacement happen, and then quite soon after we forget about it uh, and think, uh, sort of look away and think it's over. Not you, of course, because this is a uh, daily work for you. Um, I'm glad to see that uh, both Marla and Candice have uh, woken up and joined us uh, on the screen. Uh, so that's great. And we also have a couple of minutes, maybe uh, five to ten minutes, to take a couple of questions uh, from the floor. But first I wanted to ask uh, maybe Marla to say something maybe in response to Women Alma, if you want. We can't yet hear you. 
There's one dollar. I was um, fascinated by both of the presentations. I think it's really important to hear even a deeper sort of look at each one of the, the pieces that we want to try and pull into this model. So we'll definitely be in touch um, with both of you because I think it is really important as we, as we move deeper into developing the model that we have a really granular and really clear understanding of each of the, the threads that we hope to weave through it. Candice, I don't know, maybe you have another. I think Candice's uh, image may be stuck, so I'm continuing to uh, yeah, question. Yeah, obviously oh. what strikes me, uh, and I want to thank the two uh, comment. Got me? Yeah, go on, Candice. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thanks to, to Pax and, and also to uh, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for inviting us to, to share um, our, our work and also to the commentators. I, what was striking to me um, is that, you know, we have two sort of different takes. One is uh, clearly there's a lot of disparate information out there that needs to be collected um, and traced. There is a great opportunity to work with humanitarian organizations that have direct um, contact with populations that are affected, particularly the, the displacement question um, is huge. And I feel like we have, as a community of practitioners, really struggled um, to structure surveys in a way that will give us a feedback, not only for, uh, you know, military uh, officials who are involved in planning and targeteering, but also for, for, the, for those who are involved in reconstruction. Um, I think that's going to be really super important is to find ways to work with across the community of humanitarian providers uh, to better understand what it is they're seeing on the ground and collect that in a more structured way uh, so that that feeds back into uh, the reconstruction process. But overall, it's super Super complex set of topics, obviously, um, and there's a lot of work to do. So looking forward to seeing what we can do in the future. I have a question here from Anna de Coursey Wheeler. How do you see this feeding into and influencing military policies and procedures when evaluating proportionality of operations, etc.? And how can how can civil society support this? So it's actually two questions in one. Uh, maybe one of the frontline labs people uh, can first respond to this. So I'll, I'll jump in and then maybe Marla. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, and one of the things I heard repeatedly from uh, folks in the Air Force, in the United States military, um, from military planners, um, over time there was a realization that, you know, taking out a bridge or, you know, damaging a particular road that was maybe the only access point for uh, hospitals or, you know, clinics nearby or other public services that were necessary, um, you know, there was a realization that that was really problematic. And, um, and yet, you know, there was also sort of this balance that needed to be um, drawn in, in the sense of whatever the military uh, requirements were. Uh, at the same time, you know, in the U.S. context, at least, you know, the, the United States military was responsible for driving all of the reconstruction action on the ground. Um, and so they were essentially um, both the, the, the actors who created some of the destruction and then they had to put things back together. And um, one of the outcomes of that was the formation of provincial reconstruction teams um, that really struggled to have a consistent sense of what was going on on the ground, uh, a consistent sense of um, what kind of data they needed to uh, improve uh, their responses. So there was a lot of well building uh, notoriously in Afghanistan um, in places where maybe you didn't need that many wells. Uh, there was a lot of school building uh, in places where you maybe didn't need that kind of particular type of structure rebuilt um, because in fact it, it made itself more of a target uh, for future action. So I think you know, there's the targeteering piece, the, the military planning piece in advance of um, operations that can maybe help with uh, rules of engagement. Uh, that will be very key to understanding sort of what the potential impact is, particularly in close environments, uh, in, in urban settings. But I think the bigger piece uh, is, is reconstruction, actually. And what we saw again and again in the Afghanistan context was um, just a failure to connect the dots between uh, things like displacement, food insecurity, um, being caused by environmental damage, 
uh, and damage to critical infrastructure and not understanding that uh, ultimately there's a cost to that politically um, and militarily, but there's also a huge financial cost. And that is why we saw uh, so much um, kind of overspending or um, you know, poor oversight of, of redevelopment in a post-hostility setting. Thank you, Kenneth. And uh, for the sake of time, I think we jump to what's probably already the last question that we uh, have time for. And it's a question for Alma. Alma, uh, an anonymous uh, viewer, <laughs> asks you the question, do you believe military actors have a role to play in mitigating effects of displacement, or should that be left to other actors? Absolutely, yes. Um, military operations, well, let's say, are the reason or the cause of, of people being displaced, as we have seen now. Nobody's going to leave their home because uh, they don't feel, uh, they feel that they are secured. Of course not. People are leaving homes because they don't have safe environments to live in. They don't have homes. They don't have hospitals. They don't have food, water, electricity. So nobody wants to live in such dire um, environment. Military um, is responsible to mitigate the measures, to control the wide area effects to create less damage to the critical infrastructure. And if we see one being successful, we, we should see the less, less need for people to be displaced um, and, and looking for safer environment somewhere else than their homes. So yes, absolutely. Thank you, Alma. I now have good news and bad news. The bad news is that there were quite a few more questions already being asked and we don't have time for that, so that's really bad news. The good news is that most of those questions, not all, but most of those questions are actually also about the military role in all this. And that is the topic of our next session uh, starting in half an hour from now. So with that, I want to say, first of all, some of the people who still had questions that are unanswered, uh, please look at our uh, website, uh, conference website, to see if you can still catch maybe Alma or Wim or Marla or Candace or others on there and ask your question directly to them, maybe even on this uh, networking island that we talked about. Uh, and other than that, uh, I hope you have a good moment for a cup of coffee, maybe still some breakfast in the US, and we'll see you in slightly less than half an hour. Thank you. Thank you.